some are not yet uh, get connected so maybe we can change the order but radhika borde is already here so most welcome dr radhika borde who is a senior researcher at the department of social geography and regional development charles university praha chat republic she has a phd in the uh, social sciences from Virginian University in Netherland she is also a steering committee member of an international union for conservation of nature a specialist group uh, that is a cultural and spiritual values of protected area she has published articles on anthropocene social movements adivasi tribals culture and religiosity and sacred natural sites in india and just recently he has a is the last uh, detailed field study in the adivasi areas of jharkhand so he is going she is going to speak on the adivasi sacred natural sites so it is something unique and very distinct i met radhika long back at assi ghat in varanasi and then we have a very close connection <laughs> about that and some of the good friends and professors from her own university are my good friends that's how this very close type of thing so it is so good to have radhika here and be part of this uh, group and work under the ecla so dr radhika bode most welcome now please we start your presentation thank you so much professor and i remember our very nice conversation in uh, varanasi um, and it's been one of my really good memories so thank you so much for inviting me to this session i will start sharing my screen so that you can see a, a presentation i have prepared um okay so can everybody see the presentation yeah okay so um it is to do with sacred natural sites in east central india and i explore various themes among them are themes of ecology women festivals and politics um first i would like to share with you um something that is very central to the sacred natural sites and that is weekly uh, prayer meetings that occur in the sacred natural sites and you can see one of these as you can see they are mostly attended by women and these are adivasi women mostly belonging to the urao tribe in jharkhand um, jharkhand is a state in east central india um the sacred natural sites at which these women gather are called sarnas and the ceremonies that occur at these sacred natural sites are called sarna prarthana sabhas so this is just a picture of one of these ceremonies now i want to tell you a little bit more about these sacred natural sites in east central india they can be of many types but most often they are sacred groves so a sacred grove is a patch of forest that is protected for the reason that people believe that a deity or a nature spirit resides in that sacred grove and the oraos know these sacred groves as uh, sarnas and the santhals that is the members of the santhal tribe they call them jahirthans and this here this is a picture of a jahirthan so a sacred grove that is worshiped by the santhals okay now um a little bit about the ceremonies that occur uh, at these sacred groves um the prayers are offered to a deity known as sarna mata the oraos normally call her sarna mata and a tree which grows in the middle of the grove and is usually of the shurya robusta species is circumambulated so the participants circle that tree and the participants who are mostly women they pour water onto the tree and they imagine that as they are pouring water they are cooling the earth and they express that the earth is very hot at this time and uh, it's necessary to cool the earth uh, when i 
uh, heard this from them, I asked them if anyone had told them anything about global warming or climate change, and they said no. But this is their own understanding that uh, the earth is getting very hot and it's necessary to cool the earth. And they see this as a kind of symbolic um, ritual gesture, which is going to contribute towards this schooling, which they think is necessary. Okay, now, um, apart from symbolic gestures, mm -hmm help protect the environment. There are also concrete gestures, or let's not say gestures, practices, and that is the planting of trees. Now, the picture that you can see in which the women are dressed mostly in red and white saris, that picture was taken in 2008. And as you can see that this uh, area wasn't really um, forested much. And that's because this particular grove in which the women were worshiping was one that they believed had been forgotten. And they had rediscovered it through a very interesting mechanism. And the mechanism uh, was possession by the sacred grove goddess. So these women, they expressed that the goddess of the sacred grove possessed some of them and led them to this forgotten sacred grove and um, they started worshiping there and planting trees and protecting the grove in other ways. One of the ways is that they built a wall uh, to prevent encroachment or to prevent um, you know, anybody from entering the grove and destroying it. And in the second picture, uh, which is, um, taken more in the shade, you can see that the one tree that's in the first picture has grown much larger and there are many more trees. So they aren't just um, um, symbolically protecting the environment, but they're also doing it in very concrete ways. Okay, so a little bit more about how the women are led to these groves and how this um, worship of sacred groves became important. Uh, in the 90s, in the 1990s, Adivasi women in Jharkhand, they reported that they were experiencing possession by the earth goddess, the sacred grove goddess. And she would be taking them while they were possessed, they would be in a trance state to the sacred groves. Some of them were forgotten sacred groves and um, they started worshipping them. So it was mostly women who were led or were attracted to the sacred groves. However, over time, men too began to be present. And the village priest, uh, who is known as a Pahan in Adivasi culture, he also accepted to be present. And this is a later development because in the beginning, there was a conflict between the village priest and the women who started worshiping at these groves because normally the experience of um, the divine is mediated through the village priest. But here the women were getting possessed and accessing the sacred grove goddess directly. So there were conflicts um, you know, because of a cha the challenge to the authority of the Bahan. But later the Pahan accepted that the women would groves and the Pahan was also present. Um, and you can see in this picture, there are men and there's a man uh, who is wearing white and he's the younger man, uh, he's the village priest. And uh, he often gives a kind of speech at the sacred grove ceremonies. And after his speech, it's very common for women to get possessed. And I will show you a video of how they get possessed at the sacred grove. This is another picture of how the worship ceremony at the sacred grove looks like. Uh, so it's really under the open sky or under the shade of a tree. And it's in a, an area of natural beauty. Um, this is a video of the women getting possessed.
another video as well. Okay, so the goddess who is believed to be possessing the people, mostly the women, is known as Sarna Mata and this is a poster which depicts the goddess and um, she is depicted always as an old woman and she's dressed in white and um, as you can see in this poster art she is under the tree which grows in the middle of the sacred grove and there's the picture of an Adivasi who is worshipping her uh, and she's, as I said, mostly known as Sarna Mata, though she has other names such as Chala Pacho and Jahir Era. Now, the women who get possessed, they maybe you heard them um, during the song they were singing. They also were speaking and they believe that they are speaking to the goddess. In some cases, the goddess is speaking through them. So it could be both, that they are speaking to the goddess or she's speaking through them. And these are some of the articulations they make. Own empowerment or uh, about the, un the injustice that women face. Um, so now these worship ceremonies are becoming more and more uh, mainstream. So in the beginning, it was only occurring in these sacred natural sites in villages, but uh, slowly um, they are happening at major festivals. And one of the major festivals at which, at which these ceremonies occur is the festival of Sarhul. And the picture that you see with a lot of people dressed in white and like in festive clothes is of the festival of Sarhol. So these um, ceremonies also occur at these festivals. And not only are they becoming more mainstream, um, these ceremonies in these sarnas, these sacred natural sites are also becoming more politicized. And one of the ways in which they are becoming politicized is they are being contextualized uh, within the context of the Adivasi claim uh, in India uh, to a separate religion. Now to explain a little bit more about Adivasis, um, Adivasis do have recognition by the Indian government as a specific community. Uh, the Indian government um, refers to them as scheduled tribes and uh, there are some rights and privileges that they enjoy. Currently, their religion is not officially recognized as being different, um, let's say from Hinduism. And this is the claim that they are making, um, Adivasis, that their religion is older and it's based on nature worship. Adivasis interestingly also claim that they are indigenous to India and that their religion is an indigenous nature religion. And I will discuss more about these politicized articulations next. So uh, this is very clear to all of you, I think, uh, because uh, it's all in English. And um, the picture shows basically the, the, the sort of um, stage at which a kind of protest uh, event took place. And this was kind of sit-in event. So people basically sat in a place that is specified for such things. And that's Jantar Mantar in New Delhi. 
and Adivasis from all over India came there and basically uh, put forward their demand for the inclusion of a separate code or column in the Indian census, which followers of the Adivasi religion could select and thereby be counted as followers of Adivasi religiosity. Um, currently, the name for this religion, which Adivasis are trying to claim, is they have decided that it would be called simply Adivasi. And these are more pictures of this event, which took place in New Delhi. Um, perhaps a little more than a year and a half ago. As you can see, there are many female participants and um, it's interesting in the context of women um, participating more in sacred grove ceremonies that they are also very actively involved in the political articulations that um, this movement that has grown out of these sacred grove ceremonies um, is, is uh, so they are, they are participating very actively in that. And this is a picture of what is known as a women's cell. And um, within this entire movement, which is now quite large, uh, women have their own special like governance cell and they govern uh, how this movement is going to develop. And it's very interesting to consider the empowerment of women in the context of this movement, when one realizes that actually Adivasi women tend to be spiritually disempowered uh, because it is very commonly believed that they would be practitioners of witchcraft. And often um, such a belief uh, results in violence against them. Okay, so I come now to another kind of um, sacred natural site, and I showed you one kind, which was the Sarnas. And this other kind is um, a place in Jharkhand, uh, a mountain, which is called Luguburu. And it is believed by Adivasis to have been an ancient spiritual university. And it's basically a mountain with a cave complex. And you can see the entrance to the cave complex in that picture. Uh, it's a forested mountain. So there are a lot of trees and there's a cave complex. And it was similar to the sacred natural sites. It was believed to have been forgotten. Uh, and it was revived um, a few decades ago by some Adivasi students. These Adivasi students were told by a sage uh, who would kind of meditation or rituals at this place, a Hindu sage that this site was an Adivasi site and that the Adivasi students should protect it. So um, it has now become the center of a major pilgrimage festival. And you see here a picture of some of the pilgrims who have entered the cave complex. And um, it's, it attracts more than a lakh of pilgrims on a single day. There is a particular day in the year uh, in November when there is a major festival that is held at this particular sacred natural site and it attracts over a, a lakh, so that's like over 100,000 pilgrims on that particular day. And this is a picture of um, a queue that the pilgrims have made um, to enter the cave complex on that particular day. As you can see, it's a forested hill. Um, and more, more pictures of the pilgrims um, coming down the hill in this case. Uh, interestingly, as they walk up and down this forested hill, there are several sacred natural sites on the way. And um, these are marked by signs and the pilgrims perform worship at these sacred natural sites as they go up to the cave complex. 
Now we come to the last uh, question because it's an important one and it's one that we can reflect upon. And that is of how all of this religiosity, the religiosity of Adivasis is being contextualized in the context of um, mainstream religiosities or just mainstream culture in India. So you have two pictures here. One is a picture of a protest and you can see that there are people with sticks and they are protesting. And that is a picture of activists and these are not necessarily Adivasi activists, these are just activists who are protesting against the acquisition of a sacred mountain which is worshipped by Adivasis, one particular Adivasi tribe known as the Dongriakons in Orissa, another state next to Jharkhand. Uh, they're protesting against its acquisition for mining. So an Adivasi group that lives on this mountain worships it and believes that it is sacred. However, a mining company wanted to acquire it because it contained a very important uh, reserve of bauxite, a very large reserve of bauxite. And there was a lot of protest. The protest was for the reason that um, that mountain was sacred to Adivasis. So people were supporting Adivasis in their claim to protect their sacred natural site. And the other picture is uh, of um, basically a Hindu shrine, which has, which is believed to have developed over an Adivasi sacred natural site. Uh, and this is becoming rather common so you would have a sacred natural site, which Adivasis believe is um, a place where their deity resides. And uh, through various mytho mythologizing processes, um, Hindu priests would also say that this, they would also stake a claim to that site. And um, this is another thing that we, another issue that has to be considered and that is uh, of appropriation. So you have both, you have solidarity and you have appropriation. And just to sum up, um, basically the entire um, talk, um, you have a lot of these sacred natural sites all over India. There is a politicized movement of recovering them and renewing worship at these sacred natural sites. With the Sarna sites that I showed you, um, it is women who led the movement to start worshiping at these sites and start protecting them. And as I discussed, it, this movement became politicized uh, and also led to the empowerment of women. With the other sacred natural site, Luguburu, it was a different process by which this particular sacred natural site became known and became a site of pilgrimage because earlier it was forgotten and wasn't visited. And now, as I mentioned, over a lakh uh, of pilgrims visited on a single day. Uh, and this was at the initiative of Adivasi students. So uh, you have these movements um, by Adivasis for reclaiming and reasserting their religiosity. And all of it is contextualized in the current um, context in India, which is, as I'm sure you um, know, a complex one. So there are various kinds of interactions that occur. So I hope I have been able to introduce you a little bit to um, how sacred geography, um, Adivasis, ecology and politics um, are mingling in the Indian context. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Radhika Borde, for uh, giving us something very special dimension, which uh, in yeah. India generally people are not taking care of. Mm -hmm. The good part is that uh, you are talking to speak up place, come close to nature, how nature having Okay. Can you listen to me? Yes, I can hear you now. There was some yeah. 
so that is a very good point that one can see that okay oh, 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 okay 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 so that was a wonderful example mm -hmm. that when we are talking about so many things openness and all that so their movement is right in their own way that uh, why not to say this is adivasi dharma mm -hmm. so if you can go in historical context mm -hmm. starting from the mahabharata and ramayana is then we find that there was a very strong base for the adivasis so somehow now they have been neglected so this is uh, important point you are raising at international level that is so good and especially you are already attached to this uh, group of sacred uh, natural sites so that will be a good example that one can learn that how come close to nature how one can receive blessings of the nature how you can receive something in a way that you can feel so happy what we call ananda sub sublime bliss from the nature Mm -hmm. so, and uh, one of the remark in philosophy is that all this crisis generated because we are far away from the nature. Yeah. So this is study will give you a new dimension to think over that. And this, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the period of this pandemic, Corona, mm -hmm. now we are realizing, oh, oh, we have committed a great mistake. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for giving this. Uh, and then no, uh, as you know that this is going to be part of the uh, a publication and mostly most probably from his finger so i think later on i will be in contact and give you the detail so what to do how to do so thank you very much again to join thank you such a good work okay thank mm -hmm. okay thank you so i think uh, dr harveen bandari is here harveen bandari i think professor, professor bandari is visible here yeah, I'm there. Good afternoon, sir. Okay, okay. good afternoon. Namaskar. And, uh, most welcome here to talk because uh, Chun is not here. So you, you are requested to now continue from here to present uh, your uh, study based on sacrality and speciality, something like that. And uh, okay. <clears throat> so let me introduce. Uh, Professor Harvin Bandari, who is a professor and deputy dean, research and publication, Chitrakar School of Planning and Architecture uh, near Chandigarh Patiala National Highway. With an experience of 17 years, she also has many research papers published in national and international journals and also presented many papers in the international conferences. Her areas of interest include cultural heritage, living, religious heritage, vernacular architecture, and 20th century heritage in India. She has done a very detailed work on the goddesses, the sacred space goddesses, the ritual escape and related. That was based on her doctoral work and still she continuing that one. She has also worked on Amritsar, that how that city has maintained the power of sacrality and on the other hand, keeping pace with the modernity. So, okay. Arvind Vandari, you are most welcome here to join the team and now you can uh, present your paper, please. Thank you so much, sir. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Okay, and I'm audible also. Yes. A very good afternoon to all distinguished speakers. Uh, my area of research has been the cultural landscapes of North India. And out of that today, I'm presenting the sacrality and speciality of cultural landscapes of the goddess temples in North India. The sacred landscapes are considered a significant type of cultural heritage as outlined by UNESCO. We all know that. Sacred landscapes have witnessed events, miracles, cultural expressions to give us a sense of identity and unity. They also continue to be in use for their original function, which has now been significantly categorized as living religious heritage. A sacred landscape is associated with the presence of divinity, 
which is made accessible through religious symbols and rituals such as pilgrimage. Very well said by Professor Shinde. So the association of sacrality and geographical setting combined together enhances the sacred power of a place. So if I say it, in other words, the spirit of a place, the classical and mythological texts, legends, stories woven around the place and the place in itself, the geography of the place, together combine to make a sacred cultural landscape. Pilgrimage has been an age-old practice in every religion. And these sacred scapes actually act as birthplaces for interrelationships among people who undertake a pilgrimage, place specific where the pilgrimage is performed and power almighty, the divine, to whom the pilgrimage is offered. So can be rightly called the three P's of pilgrimage. Talking about the Indian context, Hinduism happens to be the third major religion in the world. And if I talk about India, it is one of the dominant religions in India. India is abundant in living religious heritage and 94% of Hindus found all over the world reside in India. So that was an important aspect which promoted me to take up this study. The Shakti temples or the goddess Shakti temples of North India are one such popularly visited Hindu temples that represent the rich living religious heritage in India. Explaining a bit about Shakti Peets, these temples are spread over the Sark nations they are built at the places where the body part of the goddess had fallen. It has an interesting legend attached to it that the body of the goddess was cut by Lord Vishnu and the part wherever it fell, a temple was built to commemorate the goddess. These temples are generally located at the highest altitude in the area. They have sites of revelation which lead to forming spiritual connections with the divine. They also imbibe cultural unity because they are visited by cross-cultural groups and they are a place for Sanskritization, which means upgradation from one caste to another, where people from a lower caste can combine with people from higher caste and perform the religious rituals together. India is said to have 51 Shakti Peets, very well marked by Professor Rana. And Shaktiism is one of the three tenets of Hinduism. All forms to be manifested under one singular supreme power. These Shakti temples are popularly called Shakti Peets in Hindu scriptures. They are located in India in large numbers at local, regional and pan-India levels. Four important, which are called four Adi Shakti Peets, 18 Maha Shakti Peets, which are places of intense power, and 51 or 108 in number. The study I'm presenting today is about the cultural landscapes of Shakti temples in specific in North India. North India has a small state, Himachal Pradesh, divided into 12 districts. And five of the very interesting Shakti Peets lie in this zone. Not five, actually seven, anciently called the Shivalik Sisters of North India. The most venerated one, Vaishnodevi Temple. After that, Chamunda Temple, Vajreshwari Temple, Jwalamukhi Temple, Jindpurni, Naina Devi, and Mansa Devi. Coincidentally, Vaishnodevi is slightly far away from the rest six, and over time, the five of them became very popular. Naina Devi, Chintpurni, Jwalamukhi, Kangra, and Chamunda. It became a popular pilgrimage circuit in North India, which the pilgrims generally adopt, especially in the most celebrated festival of Navratras, which is in fact one of the largest Hindu festivals. There are various reasons for the sacrality of these Shakti temples. Obviously, the most one because they are perceived as abodes of deities and ancestral spirit. 
this picture belongs to the famous nena devi temple which is very famous for the temple the jwalamukhi temple the kangra devi where the goddess is worshiped in different forms and along with her her consort shiva is worshiped the significant geography of the I think there were some technical issues. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly disconnected, and now it is. I think everyone has connected, as far as I can see. There was a gap of few seconds in due to internet problem. Probably you will have to allow me share the screen again. Okay. Yeah, I've done, Bhandari, Professor Mandari. I've done. Can you see that? Yeah, I can. we are able to uh, just few second professor bandari just to check that everyone is in yeah yeah sure Uh, she can go one or two slides back. Uh, may I request Professor Bandari to go? I think uh, one slides back because that's where we got connected. One more. All right. Yeah, this is fine. I'm waiting for a minute for everybody else to join in. Ah, okay. She can start. Okay, she Professor Bandari. Now everyone is here. Okay, the sacrality of the Shakti temples majorly owes to the architectural buildings, the temples constructed on them for worshipping the particular deity and the significant geography which is attached with the place, the natural landscape formations in the form of hills, caves, water bodies adds to the sacredness of these temples. The first picture is of the famous Nena Devi temple, which is located at the highest altitude in the region. The temple became the generator of the town, and the town is now called Nena Devi town in the district Bilaspur. The second picture is of the temple out of the five, which is at the highest altitude, which is the original temple, Adi Himani Chamunda, which is exposed to an overlooking hills. And this temple, an altitude which is covered by snow almost the entire year. So the temple opens up to pilgrims only for two months in a year. And there is an interesting story that the goddess appeared in dreams to one of her uh, followers and asked her to relocate this temple. And the third picture I'm showing now is actually the located temple which is again a section of the temple is built on a boulder of rock, which is again believed to be a boulder thrown by the goddess to a demon, which still holds in place and where the temple has been, the sanctum of Lord Shiva has been constructed without any walls inside this. So all such significant natural landscape formations, geography, add to the sacredness, the power of the place. The place is also believed to have healing powers. Again, a picture shared from Chamunda Devi temple where the river Ban Ganga flows from the rear of the temple. 
people take a spiritual dip there which is a part of the rituals performed inside the temple and it is believed that the people have a cure for any kind of skin disease if they take a dip in this river chintpurni temple again one of the very famous temples which is most venerated and stands at second number in the north india after the vishnu uh, vaishno devi temple is believed to remove all the worries of all the devotees if you go and seek your desires with a true heart uh, the third picture is of a, a pair of a silver eyes that are donated by the pilgrims to nena devi temple because as the name suggests nena which is a synonym of eyes that you are granted all your wishes if you donate this pair of silver eyes because it is associated the temple originally is associated with the eyes of the goddess shakti so all such legends rituals and stories associated with the historicity of the temple add to the sacrality of the shakti temple or add to its intangible values the temples also offer places of contact where a communication is formed between the human and the beyond human power or reality the picture i'm showing you is from one of these temples where havans or prayers are performed by making offerings in the temple on a daily basis the temple has been standing so for centuries but the ashes of the wood burned have never been removed nobody knows where the ashes go and how it becomes leveled again every morning for the next prayer every shakti temple that i visited i could see a religious tree standing in the middle of the complex where people seek their wishes tie threads of love and faith and when their wishes are granted they come back and untie those threads a typical door called yam door in one of the temple where animal sacrifices were performed in the past but today it is believed to be gateway to heaven again people come pray tie their threads seek their wishes and believe that the goddess will bless them the small picture the fourth fifth picture is of uh, jwalamukhi temple very famous in north india the main sanctum of the goddess has these flames erupting from various fissures in the main sanctum these flames have been continuously burning over years and years and nobody knows the secret behind them another picture of chamunda temple which is an unusual picture of a cremation ground that is built inside the temple where the local people go and offer homage to the ancestors again built with an interesting legend that the goddess promised the demon that you will never be hungry in my temple so whatever be the situation the cremation ground may or may not receive a dead body every day but as a count for 365 days in a year 365 bodies are burnt every year in this cremation ground so all such places where the spiritual communications beyond human communications take place become major reasons for the sacredness a number of festivals are celebrated in these temples month wise year wise where thousands hundreds millions of people come together to celebrate these festivals add to these sacredity the mythological legends which strengthen it the sacredity in himachal pradesh is so strong that the number of tourists have been increasing every year with 1.96 crore in 2017 and kangra stands as the third maximum visited tourist place in the state of himachal pradesh people have a belief that if they go and offer these little things where which the shops sell especially during navratras they seek goddess blessings another interesting legend of mundan ceremony where the infants get their first hair shaved off is performed specially in chintpurni temple 
the picture too shows the place where it is performed a special place which is reserved in the temple for this ceremony and all this is very deeply entrenched in the mind of indians that people who do not walk still manage to reach these places these sacred landscapes anyhow even if they cannot walk i've seen people crawling and reaching the main temple asking the goddess to grant their wishes and also people requesting the priest to perform special prayers for their families so all these mythological legends festivals stories beliefs add to the sacredity of these temples if i talk about speciality in shakti temples i could categorize the component of a temple into three main categories the highly sacred components on the basis of the visitors choice of visiting these places the medium sanctity components which comprise of all those components where a visitor may or may not like to go and there are some non sacred components which help in the smooth functioning of a temple when i analyzed these spaces in five of the temples i could find that the high sanctity component Components are present in all the temples. For the ancillary or medium sanctity components, some of them may be missing, but majorly they were present in all the five listed temples. And out of the functional components, which are basic, which are required for the running of a temple, it is not necessary for all of these to be there. Studying the speciality in these temples, also from the aspect of sacred spaces administrative spaces and visitor spaces when i interviewed the people on the site i could find that the visitors or pilgrims to the site love to spend their time after offering prayers in the spaces that were designated for the visitors but were closed apart to the sacred areas but actually this doesn't happen these temples exceed their carrying capacities and so especially in rush hours festival time security personnel are deployed in these temples who force people to leave the complex as early as possible after offering prayers but the pilgrims are not happy with that they are not convinced because they travel kilometers and kilometers to come and offer prayers and they want to spend some quality time in these temples speciality in shakti temples can also be studied from the aspect of routes that take you to the temple i put up the site plan of one case nena devi temple which is the most visited out of these five the points you can see 1 2 3 4 5 labeled in the plan they are the various entry points to the temple so the visitor can enter a temple from multiple points and the route that he takes to reach to the main shrine actually gives him a glimpse of the various spaces in the shakti temple this is a picture of in the interior of the temple complex where a path has been traced how a visitor moves from the main gate experiences the spaces in the complex and reaches the main shrine of the jwalamukhi temple showing you another elaborated case from nena devi temple where the original route which begins from this point instead of leading you straight to the temple especially in the time of festivals is diverted and the visitors are taken through an elongated path to the temple to manage the crowd so there are two different ways the normal day route and the festival day route let me show you the glimpses of the festival day route if you happen to reach the main temple these are the shops with temporary structures facades of buildings which have not been maintained people moving through the steps where the structures are too close to each other are not cleaned are not maintained the services along the route are open the streetscape does not speak volume of the sanctity of the place the people have to take a bridge to reach the main 
temple which is again very congested and very difficult to stand in a very hot sunny day and this is the way how they move and reach to the main entry to the temple so all these spaces which help to shape a pilgrim's experience do not make up for it but this was not the case originally this is a plan from the municipal corporation which says a total number of sanctioned 450 units in the layout in the plan for the nana devi town but let me show you the scenario today a dense cluster of developments that has come up rich cluster of developments all of these are commercial developments people have attributed the ground floor for commercial development the first floors have been reserved for residential apartments and this kind of cluster does not give the people a feel of the sanctity of the place there are no architectural characteristics no specific character that is being followed in the entire street scape now all this leads to some prospective risks to the socio cultural values of these temples the temple happens to have a historical value because it is a shakti peeth it has events people associated with it a number of legends it has a cultural value because of the celebrations beliefs the pilgrimage value the number of people visiting every year nana devi temple and chintpurni temple almost uh, witness 25000 to 30000 pilgrims a day during the festival season the spiritual value which is again due to the shrine the sacred components the rituals the celebrations that are performed the social value because it is very strongly associated to shakta community of hindus the aesthetic value of the temple both at the building level and at the urban design level if i try and analyze the threat level to these values i could analyze that the threat to the aesthetic value was on a much higher side i do not say in any ways that the threat to the other values is medium or is not of concern at the present but right now what needs to be taken care of is the neglected unmaintained heritage the non harmonious developments and the non characteristic architecture that is springing up in the temple complex and degrading the sanctity of the place the issues and concerns at the temple are many if i talk about at the physical level they are related to the built environment which is leading to its degradation and deterioration at a very fast rate spoiling the visitor experiences non physical level the issues where the pilgrim sacred experience is affected the heritage remains unexplored because the visitors would not aware of the historicity of shakti peeth do not come to know anything for them it is a normal temple that they are visiting in the spirit of tourism how do i relate speciality and sacrality if i categorize please, the please, physical please level conclude, please arbin please conclude yes yeah. yeah, sir please I'm conclude yes yeah, sir the aesthetic value and the all other values are communicated through the tangible heritage of the place and that is why shakti peeths are famous one of the preferred pilgrimage sites or sacred cultural landscapes in sarth nations of pakistan bangladesh china nepal sri lanka but out of them all india outnumbers them there are 42 in india the visitors are ignorant to the cultural significance the built environment fails to communicate the associated socio cultural value this may be one case that i am discussing of shakti peeths of five temples in north india and this must be a similar case for all the shakti temples and may be for other temples found in india and abroad so what needs to be done is an integrated approach for the conservation of tangible and intangible both developing a suitable management approach need for a disaster risk management all done together so that the built environment is upgraded measures to build and enrich the visitor creating awareness and regulating the site's carrying capacity all to be done with an attempt to save our heritage thank you so much
Thank you very much, Professor Harvi Bandari, for giving us a very relevant topic. So we already started from the nature worship. Now we have reached to the feminine divine in a special context, manifestive context, and mythological context, taking all three together. So that is like three local, three mythical realms, all integrated with your uh, conceptual as well as all based on the experiences describing sacred culture, cultural landscape. Thank you very much for this. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so let me now proceed to next speaker, and uh, that is Dr. Bipithal Balakrishnan Nair. She is from Seoul International Hospitality Management Institute, Usung University, Korea, South Korea, having PhD in Tourism Management from University of Bedfordshire, UK. She is a transdisciplinary researcher in tourism studies with particular interest in post-colonialism and colonial nostalgia in world making normalization and creative management development practices in the representation of peoples and places. And she is going to talk about the interfaces, complexities, simplicities, and whatever it may be, a network system between tourism and religion with uh, several case study of nature worship as well as ritual escapes. So, okay, Dr. B.P. Nair, please present your study. Thank you, Ranaji. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I feel I'm so blessed because when I am seeing some familiar names here, uh, which I am panically searching and uh, studying for my PhD defense and thesis last year, same time. Uh, so I feel so blessed today. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Yeah, it is visible. Yeah, I hope I am audible as well. Yeah. Thank you. So I would like to present one of my ongoing uh, empirical studies uh, in tourism and religion connecting sacred groves as purveyors of nature worship and cultural tangility. This short presentation I have uh, divided into five main sections. Uh, first one is quite big, that is introduction, the context of sacred groves. Next is glimpse of traditions and practices to introducing what are the main rituals and ceremonies happening in sacred groves. And uh, the third one, it's very important in terms of tourism and politics, the absolute need of reconstruction while I'm projecting sacred groves as a form of sustainability and model. Next is introduction to sustainable development goals and how I can connect the concept of and the practice of sustainable um, sacred groves and bridging. The final one is bridging traditional rituals and practices to sustainable development goals. So let us begin with an introduction. Sacred groves is not a new concept, it's everywhere in the world. But when it, when it comes to Indian context, it is much more divine, much more uh, biological and ecological concept. Sacred groves in India are the living replicas of rich heritage by connecting the ancient Arya, Dravidian, Naga and tribal cultures. It is embedded with Hindu religious essences and these groves are the best suited examples for the systems of sustainability, as well as showcase of underlying synergy of humankind and mother nature. So we can connect sacred groves in many contexts. For this ongoing study, we are connecting sacred groves in four main, main uh, themes, big context. And first one is definitely this with religiousness. Sacred groves is a big, place when religion mixed with myths, tradition, science, ancestral intelligence, and biodiversity. It is connected with various rituals of Hinduism 
and nature workshops. Especially this study is focusing on Kerala, the sacred grounds of Kerala. Even though in a single state, in a small single state, you can find sacred groves, the concept is connected with various kinds of mythologies, religiousness, goals, etc. of uh, gods that is known as Teyam. But when it is comes to the middle part and the south part of Kerala, it is largely connected with goddesses, the Shakti goddesses, and also the serpent gods. Next is when uh, the sacra groves is connected with ecology. As you can see in the picture, the sacra groves is always regarded as a place for reservoirs of traditional plants. It is a miniature of evergreen forest and habitat of millions of varieties of flora and fauna. If you're entering in a sacred groves, I'm connecting the biggest ones there, you can feel the freshness of air and you can see the abundance of medicinal plants and, and the varieties of natural flora and flora, they are balancing the ecology there. The sacred groves is also known as biological heritage sites. They are well-defined well areas that are unique, Eco ecologically fragile ecosystems. They are having rich biodiversity with either intraspecific categories or presence of endangered or threatened species or specific species of revolutionary significances. They are keeping all those uh, flora and fauna within the constructions of sacred sites or sacred groves, and they are becoming habitat of these places. Next theme is when sacred groves is connecting with heritage. Many of the sacred sites or sacred groves in Kerala is constructed more than 3000 years of ago. They are the absolute part of heritage. And indeed it is connected with that there are hundreds of indigenous ceremonies and rituals. They are the land of arts. You can connect with traditional music, dance and craft. As you can see in this picture, the Ebo one is a traditional art known as Kalamiritu, that is, uh, that is uh, normally doing at the practice of Naga worship, that serpent god worship, maybe happening monthly or specifically in two months, mainly in October and July. The below picture, there's an art form. This is known as Teyam, dance of gold. Both of these are becoming one of the biggest attractions of Kerala tourism. Here, you can see the glimpse of traditions and practices associated with sacra groves. In the biggest picture is the is a traditional music. It's a part of ancient culture of Naga and Dravidian culture. This is known as um, Kalamiritu and uh, Pullu and Pato. This is we, we, they are creating, they are uh, making a prize for the goddess serpent at the time of rituals. This is an essential element. This is come under the endangered species, endangered element of arts. And here, these two pictures is different varieties of dance of gods, that is Teyam. And the, below this picture is a ceremony is associated with the serpent worship along with these art forms, that is Kalamirita. This one is the ritual normally happening at what's in October, the month of October, in specific designated place of sacred groves. So as you can see, these are the amalgamation of rituals and religious ceremonies and practices. When it comes to connecting this kind of study with tourism, there are many perspectives we need to consider. So we are considering the current study for balancing tourism and representation, tourism and sustainability. When it comes to perspectives of tourism, this is an amalgamation of attractions of spiritual, religious, nature, culture, heritage, rural, and food tourism. Every element is directly or indirectly connected with various forms of tourism 
and the state government and other tourism bodies are heavily promoting. And surprisingly, both domestic and international tourism are flourishing in these kind of sacred sites. I am not considering the COVID-19 situation, but I am telling uh, pre-COVID. These are the excellent amalgamation of ancient brilliance as well. The visitors are enjoying how brilliantly these sustainable systems are maintained by the ancestors. Their ecological balance, their fabulous attracted uh, buildings and heritage, their medical sectors, medical tourism there, and art forms and museums are available. These are also examples of carrying capacity and food fall control based on season. What are the, the modern tourism uh, terminologies are trying to define with this kind of sustainable concept? This is already implemented years ago in these kind of sacred groups. For example, these sacred groups never open every day. Except one or two temples, they are only opening once in a while, once in a year, or once in one or two times in a year for workshops. So they can keep the sustainable balance of all other kinds of flora and fauna. In, even while they are opening, they are creating some kind of economy and they are, uh, they, they are using those money taken from those kind of period for the sustainability for the rest of the period. And also they won't allow everybody come into the sacred grove to visit. There are strict traditions and rituals they need to follow. There should be a limited amount of people are going inside the sacred groves, very inside uh, with some strict restricted arenas. So these are the examples, even they are connected with mythological or they are named as mythological practices. However, if we are closely watching, these are the examples of ancient brittleness for making our land sustainable and connecting the religious and sustainability. People always seek some kind of gods and goddesses with some kind of respect and some kind of care. That is created as a mythological background and sacred groves are always working along with it. Here it's come the need of absolute reconstructions. Because we are trying to project, we are connecting the sacred groves of Kerala as a practice of sustainability, or rather it is a big example of um, sustainable development goals projected by the United Nations. But there is a big problem for these kind of studies. There is an absolute need of reconstruction because currently in tourism literature, these ancient practices are projected as stereotypes such as nomadic, oriental, and mystical. They are representing all these practices as others, or this is a practice of otherness by the hegemonical Western uh, authors. Therefore, it is essential to address the ontological and epistemological standpoints of those standardized representations. The ontology and epistemology, the voice where it is coming, who are the others and how they are understanding these practices because this is a very much traditional ethnographical study and the construction or reconstruction are also addressing and this is also a venue of for creating call for the significance of an emic epistemological standpoint through the study we are also addressing what is the insider's perspectives while we are describing, while we are representing, or while we are projecting these kind of ancient practices as one of the biggest models of sustainable development goals. This is not a symbol, but we are feeling this is a part of tourism and politics. We are trying to break the current uh, Western hegemonized uh, representations of India, rather the practices of ancient nature worship it is uh, by projecting this is not more than this is more than the so called snake charming but this is something biggest of uh, sustainable development goals so in the era of global transition to sustainability 
these sites deserve a much more international platform. Rather, we are locally, we are agreeing this is a matter of sustainability. But if we are, we need an international platform to project the richness of Indian culture and heritage and religion, and which could not be attained through the modern theoretical conceptualization. Therefore, this connecting to sustainable development goals for a better scientific explanation and understanding. As an introduction, the sustainable development goals are a collection of 17 global goals designed to be a blueprint to achieve a better, more sustainable future for all. Currently, this study is trying to connect sacred growth with all these kind of goals, which is relevant to the context. We are using a transdisciplinary approach because trans, uh, sacred groves is something connecting through tourism, cultural studies, anthropology, religious, uh, religious studies, history and heritage, and many more disciplines. We are trying to cross the borders of maybe the fragile or thick border, the thick uh, borders of all this disciplinarity and creating a more fruitful um, insight about the study context. And of course, we are using an interpretive paradigm and using triangulation and breakership principles. This is, uh, we used, for this study, we used two case sites. First one is known as Iringol Kavu. It is a Hindu forest temple dedicated to Goddess Durga, situated in Ernagulam district, Kerala, India. This is a, a big uh, land around 54 hectares uh, and there's a small temple situated. This uh, forest is considered to be a habitat of hundreds of varieties of medicinal plants and different kinds of reptiles, birds and bugs. The second site is one of the famous religious tourist sites in the central Kerala that is known as Manarashala Sri Nagaraja temple. It is very ancient and internationally known center of pilgrimage for the devotees of serpent gods. As you can see this picture, Manarshala is a famous serpent god temple and it is surrounded by a thick forest having a habitat of similar medicinal plants and a big pond there. They are having a varieties of fishes. They are at endangered list. So we are coming at the end of this uh, presentations. This is our preliminary study because of COVID-19, we cannot go back to the uh, we cannot go back to the site now. So we conducted a pilot study in 2019, three, three months. We were the study site. We did the pilot study, pre-electrography by observations, interviews, etc. And these are the preliminary observations. We could connect it. Uh, sacred growth as the sustainable development goals explained here. We can connect sustainable growth by the parameters of life on land, affordable and clean energy, climate actions, responsible consumption and production, sustainable cities and communities, good health and well-being. And there are many more uh, sustainable goals we can connect it with this but it is need to be more data uh, related to that. Uh, we hope the COVID-19 will allow us to go there again and collect more data. To wrap up, the proposed study have been the amusing her inheritance of India by unveiling the age old cultural practice of society by demystifying its heritage and culture by providing scientific explanation behind the unique platforms in sacro groves rather than presenting the findings buried under so-called superstitions. We are, we are projecting these kind of nature workshops and uh, cultural and heritage practices and rituals and ceremonies and religiousness embedded with as with scientific explanation by connecting the parameters of sustainable development goals as suggested by United States, United Nations. Therefore, it can be demystified. It cannot be super, say as a superstitions, rather we are, we are, when we are connecting this kind of practices, the, the ancient brilliance of sacred groves, this become a science, this become a evidence. We are trying to demystifying this concept and the, the richness of Indian religious through this concept. The next is anticipated to generate a rich 
in-depth understanding on sacred groves as the religious landscapes and its cultural, religious, tourism implications as an ancient Indian practice of sustainability and as the form of potential tourism attractions, which in turn is contributing sustainable development goals. For uh, attaining these kind of goals, we already collected information from the uh, pre-COVID-19, the visited international tourists, and make them understanding. So collected the perceptions, current perceptions of them, and we are making several changes of the current study by using uh, more data and triangulations, and we hope we could attain our, um, our uh, research aim. Thank you very much for this opportunity, especially to Ranaji. Thank you. Thank you very much to VP Nair for presenting the old concept, what we call old is gold now, especially in this particular environment when we are facing pandemic situation. So you have very rightly tried to reawaken, you can say like that. Or you can say in a way, if you can follow the ecological philosophy, what Arne Nass, famous Norwegian, uh, philosopher who has coined the word deep ecology. So he tried to emphasize it is the question of self-realization. S is capital. Self-realization based on the nature, come close to nature, it is nothing like thought, but the practice. The way you have illustrated all these things, it reminds that when uh, uh, that professor when, uh, was uh, close to Gandhiji during 1932, the first time he tried to raise that a time will come that people will realize that based on the nature, especially closeness, not only science, but your uh, attachment with the nature, people will realize and then only we can get peace and good society. So very rightly, you have tried to uh, highlight that uh, situation, what Professor uh, Alden Nair, uh, Nais, Nais, N-A-E-S-S, -S, and this Nair, Nais. 1932, he said, now you have proved that what is the relevant today. So thank you very much for reviving the old thought with philosophy as well as practical relevance today. Thank you very much. And I think we will co collaborate, cooperate, and go together what we call, let us co-sharing to make our mother earth happy, healthy, and that get blessing from the mother earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Namashi. Okay. Now, may I request uh, Professor December Prasad Satiji? I hope that uh, he's here. Yeah. I'm here, sir, yes. Professor Sati? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, yes. Can okay. you hear me, sir? Now, okay, so welcome to Professor Sati. So, uh, in a symbolic way, I can say that we started from Radhika. Radhika, the goddess Radha who is linking also with all the Ras Leela, with the Mother Earth and all that. And now we are coming here to Vishambar. So here is also that divine feminine spirit related to Mother Earth and coming from the Himalaya and then going to the coast. So, so glad to see Vishambarji here and you are going to present the case of uh, Himalaya. So let me say a few words about Professor Sati, who is professor, who has already had professor of geography and Resource Management in School of Earth Sciences, Mizoram University, Central University at Mizoram. Okay, it's specialized in mountain research, sustainable agriculture and mountain tourism. His publication include over 150 research papers and 20 books and anthology, including two recent books from Springer Interna Nature International. Currently, he is also working in a leading project that is called economic and ecological implication of shifting cultivation in Mizoram. So that is something very rare geographer are doing. So you are a rare species. So we have to save you properly so that we can get a lot of insight and guidance for that. So, okay, Professor Sati, please go ahead and uh, let us have uh, sharing and be part of the pilgrimage tourism in Himalaya with your presentation. Thank you very much, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ranaji. 
and um, actually i am very much thankful of you that you have invited me to uh, participate to my um, research in this international conference and i am going to share my uh, presentation now here So my presentation is on pilgrimage tourism in the Himalaya, inflows and trends. So uh, yeah, can you hear me, all of you? Okay, yes, yes, please you, go ahead, thank sir. You. Thank you very much. And uh, I am talking on these uh, few uh, these outlines like uh, pilgrimage tourism in the Himalaya, objective and methodology that I have, and major pilgrimages, river valleys and highlands. Pilgrims inflow, trends of pilgrimage tourism, and conclusion. I will go with these outlines. So, uh, uh, actually, pilgrimage to the Himalaya is a very centuries old practice. It is not new, and it is referred in uh, our uh, this religious scriptures like Mahabharata, like Ramayana. From that time, we have uh, this uh, knowledge of pilgrimage tourism in the Himalaya. It has been the center for spiritual attainment for pilgrims for various sects and religions. Uh, not only the Hindu, they are Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, they all have their belief on the Himalaya. And Himalaya it, itself is an embodiment of the Almighty God. And in Hindu religious scriptures, Himalaya is embodiment of Lord Shiva. All the pilgrims, even in all sects or uh, uh, the uh, religions, they visit these highland pilgrimages and valley pilgrimages, and they believe that visiting these pilgrimages once in a lifetime get rid of them from the cycle of birth and death. So that way, this uh, these highlands and uh, valley regions, because there are many highland pilgrimages, and as well as there are valley pilgrimages. So that way, the people have lots of belief on this, uh, the pilgrimage sites of the Himalaya. Actually, the main objective of this study was to describe the major pilgrimages in the Uttarakhand Himalaya and to illustrate pilgrimage inflow and trends in these pilgrimages. So my, I have two objectives mainly, that uh, the inflow during the last, I have some data, and then the trend of these pilgrims, it is decreasing or increasing from the last 20 years. So we have um, uh, collected 18 years data, 2000, 2018, on pilgrims inflow and from Uttarakhand Tourism Development Board. And these data were then analyzed and we observed that the trend and the inflow of pilgrims in the deep pilgrimages in the Himalaya. And also we little bit discuss about the factors affecting pilgrimage tourism in the Himalaya because there are many factors, natural and cultural. They are affecting largely the, the, this pilgrims tourism in the Himalaya. So you, if you see that uh, this map, uh, you will find that all corners of the, Him the Uttarakhand yeah, one thing is here that I want to show only the highland pilgrimages and also valley pilgrimages that are located in the Uttarakhand Himalaya. And within the Himalaya also, the earlier uh, one um, presentation was on the Himachal Pradesh and also the Jammu and Kashmir. But Himalaya, the Uttarakhand is also having lots of pilgrimages and the Uttarakhand is also known as the land of gods and goddesses and like this, local deities also. So if you see this map, uh, the, the eastern part of this map is uh, the Kumau Himalaya, where we have only few uh, um, uh, pilgrimages, like Chota Kailas is in route to the um, Kailas Mansarova route. And then we have Dunagiri and Champawat. These two pilgrimages are located in Champawat district. And Champawa district is uh, known as the cultural place in Kumau Himalaya. And then two uh, important pilgrimages in the Kumau Himalaya. One is Bageshwar, is known for the temple of Lord Shiva, the Bhagnath, which is located in the 
confluences of two rivers. One is Gomati, is joining uh, um, Saryu River in Bageswar. And one of the important is that Jageswar is located in the Jataganga River. And Jageswar, the import, historicity and historical importance of Jageswar is that the Jageswar temples were built by uh, Adi Guru Sankaracharya of Kaladi, as it is written in our religious scriptures. So one important thing that I want to tell you that all these pilgrimages you will see, either they are highland pilgrimages or they are river valley pilgrimages, they all are located in the river valleys or on the bank of the rivers. I will come into that point. So if you see the pilgrimages of the Garhwal Himalaya, we have Panch Badris. Panch Badris means the five temples of Lord Shiva in Lord Vishnu. Badris means the Vishnu, the, uh, <coughs> yes. Uh, so uh, five temples of the Vishnu, and they are located in different places. Like the main temple is in Badrinath, then we have Bhavishya Badri, we have uh, Adi Badri, we have uh, this uh, Yoga Dhyana Badri. So there are um, uh, five temples of Lord Vishnu. Uh, they are located in different places and they all are accessible by road. So you can travel in these uh, temples by road. Second we the Panch Kedar. Kedar means the Lord Shiva. The Lord Shiva has five temples. They are very renowned temples and they are very famous temples like uh, the Kedarnath is one of the temple temples and then Madhmeshwar is there, Tunganath is there, Kalpeshwar is there and also Rudranath. So five temples of uh, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Shiva. And one important thing that this all these Panch Kedars or temples of Lord Shiva, you have to track there. So Kedarnath, if you are going, you have to trek 16 kilometers. And even Kalpeshwar, Tunganath, Rudranath, you have to trek. So on the way, on the one hand, the Badri, the all Panch Badris are located on the roadside, and these Panch Kedars are located. Um, you have to trek. They are they are in remotely located where road connects, connectivity is not there. And then another is Panch, Panch Priyags. Priyags means we all know about that confluencing of the two rivers. Although Uttarakhand has five, sorry, eight Priyags. The first Priyag is Kesav Priyag, a Saraswati river meeting with the Alagna river in Mana village. But we have the most of the scriptures, they, they mention only five Priyags. So we have like Vishnu Priyag, Nanda Priyag, Karan Priyag, Rudra Priyag, and Dev Priyag. Dev Priyag is the last Priyag where the river Bhagirathi that meets with the river Alaknanda. And then it is called the Ganga. Ganga is called only after Dev Priyag. Before that, it is Bhagirathi river. And when the Alaknanda meets with the Bhagirathi, then it is called Dev Priyag. So then we have Yamunotri and Gangotri Highland temples. They are very famous temples and both temples are located in uh, uh, Uttarkasi district. Yamunotri is located on the bank of the river Yamuna and Gangotri is located on the bank of the Ganga or the Bhagirathi river. Then we have one another very important highland temple is called Mahasu Devta temple. It is located in Hanol. Hanol is a last part of the corner part of Dehradun district. And the, because this Dehradun district has two different um, cultural uh, and natural entity also. One part is plain area, another part is very different that is called Jonsar Bavar and their cultural uh, culture, custom, food habits, everything is different. So that is also one of the one of the important and then people they are now demanding to the government of Uttarakhand that to, to, to declare it as one of the dham, one of the dhams. And then we have also the two important pilgrimages that is Haridwar and Rishikesh. All you know about this. Haridwar is known as the, as uh, the gateway to God and Rishikesh is the yoga capital of world. They are all adjective nomenclature given to them. 
So all these uh, uh, pilgrimages, they are very important. They are, and there are many other also valley pilgrimages, but I am just talking only on these, what you have. I am just, because I have the data related to pilgrims inflow and their trends on these pilgrimage sites. So here, if you go sometimes to visit the Uttarakhand Himalaya, you will see that all there is sanctity. You, you, there are, I, I prepared this map and we have five routes, different routes. So if you want to go to visit these highland pilgrimages or valley pilgrimages, you need about 10 to 12 days to visit all places. So the first route is devoted to Gangotri and Yamunotri. Then second route is devoted to the Panch Kedars. Third route is devoted to Panch Badris. Fourth is for Panch Priyaj. And last one is Haridwar and Rishikesh. So all these routes are, uh, um, uh, some, are, some you have to track somewhere and some are connected by roads. So if you see these uh, uh, the very, very important uh, for figures, the first one is Haridwar. A, 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 a pilgrim is taking holy deep in Haridwar, very, very pure and very, very spiritual place Haridwar is. And second one, you can see that uh, this is Dev Priyag, as I told you that the Alagnanda river is flowing from the left and uh, the um, uh, Bhagirathi is coming from uh, the right side. And you can see that confluencing and then Ganga, the, the name Ganga is driven from that place. And then third one is that the people are in a long queue and there is raining also during this monsoon season because the pilgrim season is um, is taken place mainly during the monsoon season and lots of rains and snow also they are in the highlands so people are in queue because they have to trek about uh, 16 kilometers to reach the Kedarna temple in the last one you can see that is the Kedarna temple but that temple is before um, uh, 2013 after 2013 because in June 2013 there was cloud bus triggered uh, um, uh, this uh, um, flash flood and uh, debris flow, and that has destroyed the whole uh, Kedarnath area, Kedarnath the town, the pilgrim, the, the pilgrim, pilgrim site. So now there is reconstruction going on, but you cannot see that uh, the the, the uh, situation of Kedarnath as you can see in this figure. So these four figures only for your uh, um, this thing for you. So, because we have collected data on this, uh, all these pilgrimages, and then uh, we have divided the data into domestic pilgrims in flow and also the foreign pilgrims, because foreigners also visit these areas. And 19 years total, we have the data. And if you can see here that the valley pilgrimages, Haridwar is having the highest inflow. The mean value is about 12 million. Because Haridwar is well connected by, by road, well connected by air and also by railway. So it is easy to go Haridwar and lots of pilg pilgrims, they visit Haridwar. And then it is followed by the Rishikes. It is about for, uh, for uh, uh, 0.4 million. And then we have uh, Kedan Badrinath also because lots of uh, domestic pilgrims, they visit Badrinath because Badrinath is uh, approachable by the road. And when you see this uh, Yamunotri, very few also, very few, because Yamunotri is located in a remote area and you have to track about 16 kilometers. Kedarnath, little bit more uh, pilgrims visiting about 0.3 million, plus 0.3 million, because Kedarnath also having uh, the chopper services. So helicopters, they are, going from Dehradun and some other part. So some people who have enough uh, these um, resources, they can travel by this also by chopper. If you see the foreign pilgrims inflow, it is very least in Yamunotri because there is no way to go because no transportation facilities. You have to trek. And also Badinath is on the roadway, but the people, they don't go there. But if you see that Haridwar, Haridwar, the uh, foreign pilgrims inflow is very high. And it, it is followed by Rishikesh because these two are the valley pilgrimages. 
and then likewise kedarnath because kedarnath is little bit uh, one one more than 1000 foreign pilgrims they visited the mean value i am talking because kedarnath as i told you it is connected by air so i have now this trend i want to show you the trend of uh, the overview of the trend of uh, this uh, domestic tourist of pilgrims inflow so you, if you see that because this is combination of tourist and pilgrims if you see that this um, uh, this slide the cultural places the tourist domestic tourist visiting cultural places you can see that graph so because cultural means mainly the pilgrimages so their number is very high and natural locales and administrative towns they are they are not increasing also they are almost some very few people go there even uh, the tourist also but when you see that cultural places a number of pilgrims they visit there and one important thing that trend i was i wanted to show you that though it is increasing from 2000 onwards but in 2013 as i told you there were more than 10000 pilgrims dead and more are still not found their body they are um, people they don't know where they went so because of a, a very huge uh, this natural calamity natural disaster took place and there is lots of discussion also now about this uh, the movement the mass movement of people in these highland pilgrimages but after 14 you can see that it is increasing mostly the domestic tourists they are coming all over india and visiting these highland pilgrimages but when you see that uh, this foreign tourist uh, um, or pilgrims inflow foreign administrative towns they are more than in other like cultural and natural locales because they can they can go easily to administrative towns and one thing is there because in administrative towns there are facilities of accommodation and also the transportation they visit they are largely so if you see these highlands domestic pilgrims in flow in the highland pilgrimages you will find that badrinath as i told you that it has a number of pilgrims out number of pilgrims visiting every year then to the gangotri or yamunotri or kedarnath is followed and then again if you see that 1314 the the pilgrims in flow domestic pilgrims in flow in the highland pilgrimages very low because as due to that disaster and again this is increasing so that believe we have even there was a very huge devastation that is called the himalayan tsunami that much uh, the intensity that uh, disaster had but people still now have started going and it is also increasing trend kedarnath as i told you because it is connected by airways so that uh, the the pilgrims in flow is higher than the gangotri and yamunotri they are very remotely and also the transportation facilities are not as it should be there so if you see the foreign pilgrims in flow in all four highland pilgrimages you will find that in kedarnath they are higher and then also there is no trend now it is almost there is no increase and decrease almost the same but here in 2014 to 2000 2004 to 2006 the pilgrims foreign pilgrims were high there and otherwise in all places their number is almost remaining the same during the last 80 80 20 years now this is about the valley pilgrimages so if you see the two valley pilgrimages are increasing trend and even this 13 devastating uh, the cloud busting or landslide and uh, this flash floods and debris flow does not have impact any much impact so the people they are uh, the, the the pilgrims they are still visiting in haridwar uh, and uh, in risik in uh, risikesh the trend is almost the similar the, there is no uh, change and also if you see the foreign pilgrims in flow in the river valley pilgrimages like rishikesh and haridwar the foreigners also they are outnumbered in the in haridwar than to the rishikesh and you can see here they are numbered also and it is little increasing but after this 13 it is all almost the same 
and this is my last slide and then i want to talk about this what the major problems facing these pilgrimages are because the whole himalaya is very highly sensitive uh, highly vulnerable and sensitive for uh, natural hazards and disasters mainly the climate induced like uh, like landslides like uh, debris flow like flash floods like uh, mass movements and because the uh, the, the uttarakhand himalaya receives the highest rain during the monsoon season and that is the peak season for the pilgrims to visit the highland pilgrimages that's why and there is no also systematic uh, uh, you know that um, approach by the government and then uh, this has led a very very uh, this himalayan tsunami like uh, consequences during 19 2013 and that's way this is very very because all the one thing is there uh, because uh, all routes going to these highland pilgrimages are very fragile and they are also vulnerable so that is one problem and then another problem is mass tourism because now government of uh, because what happened that the pilgrims actually they mostly they belong from the poor um, poor society and they have uh, not much resources so they go to the highland the highland pilgrimages they have their own arrangements so the generation of income is not much high that's why the government what government has done that they have started mass tourism the sports tourism like river rafting in the valleys like trekking like mountaineering like skiing they have developed the only one of the important international skiing center they have developed so the the, the tourists because they are rich and they are going for sports and they are spending lots of money and it is generating income and employment to the state so they are promoting and this will lead to later on to some some uh, impact will will adverse impact on pilgrimage tourism and cultural erosion is one of the very important thing though this uh, the the two, the pilgrims they are visiting uttarakhand they are strengthening the culture of the uh, the area but what happened because due to this loss of people are involved they are service provider for these pilgrims during the main season and then they adopt they are more adopting the culture of the pilgrims they are not showing their cultural uh, what you but the uh, characteristics to them so lots of debates and discussion is there let them to show also they are the night events like uh, professor uh, rb singh was talking about that we have to um, we have to conduct live live night events geography night events like this so we have to conduct also this night time events and so our culture because uttarakhand culture is very rich the people have more close to the closer to the nature like one uh, this um, one presentation was before me nayar miss nayar she was showing that how the kerala people are so close with the nature like uttarakhand also the same thing so that way and then what happened that we our the, our fears festivals and our all, all cultural activities the, the little bit decreasing because of all these impact coming from this tourism within india and outside india and then another is important thing is lack of infrastructure facility like accommodation so the pilgrims i as i told you they many of them are not having good resources so they need some range of hotels they cannot stay in a expensive hotel so that is lacking their accommodation is one of the problem and because during season also their number is very less during the season pilgrim seasons uh, they are overcrowded pilgrims so th sometimes they they just come back from the tourist the pilgrimages same day they come back i have example of the uh, gangotri temple that the, the the tourists visiting the pilgrims 5000 pilgrims visiting per day but only 200 or 300 carrying capacity in terms of accommodation the um, the um, this uh, gangotri has so that all pilgrims coming back transportation is one of the major problem because landslides during this monsoon season Uh, is very big problem and all the region is very very fragile so that the uh, the, the, the pilgrims they face the you know, this uh, problem and then institutional also in the himalaya uttarakhand himalaya there are hundreds of thousands of 
very good, good highland sacral places, but they are unknown because they are not publicized and uh, not as only the four dhams and four highland sacral places and two river valleys except them people, they don't know much of the places. So these are some of the problems and we can cope with all these problems after facilitating through institutional development, through transportation development, through accommodation. And then we have to check everything. Also, we have to show our cultural richness. There are many also UNESCO has declared them cultural heritage site like Nanda Devi, this wildlife centuries. And Nanda Devi is one of the very spiritual goddesses of Uttarakhand. So likewise, these are many things we have to think about this. And I thank you very much, particularly Professor Ranandji. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to share my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Vishambhar Satyaji, for giving us uh, just like a uh, cool pilgrimage in the Himalaya. But some of the things you tell, uh, I make with uh, some information that. Uh, in 1974, the thesis was uh, submitted uh, in 72 and published in 74, Hindu Places of Pilgrimage in India by Surinder Bhardwaj, based on uh, the Himalayan region. It was considered to be a pioneering and a classical book. So one side we are talking about data, we have also to talk about experiences and the ancient literature. Generally, we say in English mythology, but in practice, they are more than that. It is nothing like only mythology. They have manifestive power, something carried out the long age old tradition. So how that can be parallelly linked with the data analysis, that is another issue through your researches one can understand. Like one example I can cite. You have cited uh, the like Panchaprayag. This is one of the circuit of Yatra about Pariyag. But if you read the literature, I am talking about Puranic literature, uh, going to the Matsya Purana and some other Purana, a little bit work I have. There are 14 Pariyags, where there are two main river or a small some stream is meeting, that is Pariyag. So this way the description and then they have tried to put all the symbolic references. So this is the way that the study started. And here we are coming with the modern, all the data, so this is uh, very good for the young researcher. They can try to link uh, the ancient basis and the modern things, what is going on. The one important thing I get from your uh, whole analysis is that when you are talking about pilgrimage, there is no legality in our constitution about pilgrimage. That is another big problem. Then again, when we are talking about this heritage, still there is no heritage law in India, either in only two, three states, and that is sectional level, that is Tamil Nadu and uh, West Bengal and the Kerala. No other state having full heritage law. There is another problem that how to link together. And the yes. third thing, what already highlighted by one of our speakers, that uh, there is nothing like clear cut, uh, you can say, to, when you are saying tourist in Indian context, especially domestic and talking about such a rich area like Himalaya, in real sense, you think they are tourists, no? Majority of them are there as pilgrims. And you very rightly cited that most of them, they are deeply rooted with the feeling and they are mostly poor. So nothing consideration from the legal side, institutional side. So these are very important insights you have highlighted. And I hope that can be taken seriously by followed up the researcher. Thank you very much for such an exhaustive report on Himalaya. So we have already started our journey from the sacred sites, uh, that is Adivasis in Jharkhand and uh, Urisa, and then he started to go to some other sacred areas. So there is a man, my good friend, who, who is coming from Kerala. So he had traveled all the way from Kerala, going to Kanyakumari, etc., and then going to Himalaya, then going to Mazuli, then going to West, a great traveler. So I thought that, uh, he is present here. I got the information he is here. So why not I can take this benefit and give a little bit burden of my friendship just to say something, remarks, or his own experiences. 
So may I now request Professor M. Satish Kumar, who has been so kind to accept my request to give the concluding remarks. The man is just a few lines. Of course, he will present his paper tomorrow. He is the only Indian first time in the British history who is going to be honored for doing social activism for the marginal people, poor people, uh, rejected people. So he is a great, nothing like only theory. He is a man of practice. He devoted his life always in trouble and always in smile to serve the poor. And that's why he got a position also, Director of Internationalization, Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Of course, he's also Professor of Geography. So he has tried to put this old classical tradition of geography, geography. So Mother Earth to be put on the line and served. So Satish is uh, that example and kind enough. So, okay, now I request Professor M. Satish Kumar to just try to link together and then uh, say something more inspiring and guidelines. Okay, Satish. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ranaji. Uh, thank you very much for all the speakers. I'm sorry I was not able to capture the earlier part of the, the, the seminar because of the problems with the Wi-Fi connectivity in the hotel. Um, just a very quick recap. I have been in India uh, as a visiting professor with uh, Banaras Hindu University in the Malia Center. And I was for six months uh, during the lockdown. I have now moved to Delhi and I'm heading back to the UK. Uh, so just as a very quick cap, I really enjoyed the, the opportunity to hear the two, three speakers, uh, Professor Harveen Bandari, uh, Dr. Nair, uh, at this point, uh, key strand cultural heritage, the overarching theme is cultural heritage. Yeah. Uh, Harveen Ji's uh, presentation of the Shakti spaces in Himachal Himalayas. I, I think it is a fascinating uh, referencing point of how uh, tracking down the key sites of Shakti uh, temples in Himachal Pradesh and also trying to understand the different nuances in terms of its location, relocation, and the management of those cultural sites. Um, it comes, I mean, it doesn't come at much of a surprise, but I just thought it would be useful to say that how those areas have become really significant when he talk in terms of his cultural values and the uh, I think it's very important in this presentation where you make a reference to how cultural significance is lost, is misplaced. And I think that is an important point. How do we raise awareness of these cultural places? And for me, that has been quite significantly important in my own journey. The other, of course, is in terms of the harmonious and non harmonious development. And I think that is a Room, either their corner, and I see many examples of these protein sites being taken over by different builders at the cost of its cultural value. So there is a lack of appreciation of how significant these cultural values, aesthetic values, really mean to an average individual. And I think there is that particular aspect that being neglected, being unmaintained, and particularly the non harmonious development has created a lot of problems. But I can't go into too many details, but I just thought that in the early years when I was in JNU, when I was doing my PhD and, and when I was teaching there, one of the key questions that came to me regarding Shakti, and I mentioned that to Rana Ji as well, that one of the issues is that when you look at Shakti and the symbolisms associated with Shakti, um, you find that the lion symbolism has been replaced by tiger. The tiger iconography has become more prominent than the lion. And there, if you look at the paleo paleological evidence, paleontological evidence, paleoecological evidence, you find that there are parts of India where lions and zebras came together, exist together. If you look at Sankalia's work, 
and all of them, you'll find that there are archaeological evidence, paleontological evidence that has disappeared. And there are many reasons, factors, both geological factors for its disappearance, but also interesting cultural factors. And I think, you know, bringing that critical thinking into the Shakti domain really raises the potential of people being able to understand the significance of how Shakti Devi as a latent power, manifest latent power, itself is organized in spaces. So I just throw in an idea, which I'm sure Ranaji will, will have a conversation, but something for the young researchers to consider. The second presentation on sacred groves is also interesting by Dr. Nair. And I, have, as I said, I've spent six months in, uh, in, in Kerala, in Northern Kerala. So I'm quite familiar with all of those aspects. And I think there are areas which are quite interesting in how the, the issues of sacred spaces have emerged over a point of time. And I like the fact that you, know, you are bringing in the element of the Devi, uh, particularly the Naga worship, which is quite significant and quite important area, the, uh, the mystical uh, sort of mis, uh, misinterpretation, uh, mis, misinformed ideas of these sacred spaces. And I think that is a very potent area of research, which again, raising awareness. Kerala, as you know, has already a much significant awareness across the board. But here's something which I found that again, many such sacred spaces are now overgrown, overrun, completely neglected because the state government doesn't have the money or the resources to take care of these areas. Some of the old ancient Shiva temples are lying completely decrepit, dilapidated, left completely to the side. And again, highways have come up, people don't care about it. Something which has been, people have raised issues, but I think through the study to raise more awareness of these neglected sacred spaces or sacred groves are really, really important. And I think the more you can put, push for those ideas to come into the forefront, that'd be fantastic. And so that again, I thought it was very important. Just a one point which I thought was equally important when you look at the Nagas and the Naga Devas, particularly Naga, as you know, Naga Devas are a representation of Shiva itself and the manifestation of Naga as an energy. So there is this idea of how the, the kinetic energy and the static energy of Shiva is manifested through the Naga deities in the sacred groves. So there is this idea of how do you protect, how do you protect these sacred groves to really, uh, and also how to educate the people who are not aware of the significance of sacred groves. You touched upon the significant, significance of sustainable development. So I'm really pleased about it. And again, the potential of sustainable development goals with the 17 goals and many sub goals needs to be integrated. Just putting SDG in is not enough. We need to unpack it and relate it to the key sacred growth, which is going to be more useful for people who are looking into the ways in which you can change the policy and change the approach. The last one, of course, is Professor Vishambar Prasadji's uh, presentation, which I thought was very interesting. As I said, I have spent time, as Ranaji has said, I have spent time in Gangotri. I've done all the Kedarnath treks. I've done, gone to Gangotri, Buddha Kedar, areas completely inaccessible. And even going to the Cutling glaciers to look at the source of the Ganges. So it's a fascinating site, again, untouched, unrepresented. And I think again, Professor uh, Rana has already mentioned areas of things that can be pulled together. And I think within the point of, the reference point that you have presented, I think there is the whole idea which really captured my imagination is about cultural erosion and how do cultural erosion, how do you get cultural erosion more so with much more compatible and common data. And I think there is a big area of interest that cultural erosion, if it's taking place, how do we protect it? The other of course is more climatic and I'm going to talk about that climatic change but, and I've been part of the ECMOS uh, group looking at all the cultural heritage, an area of climate change and the built environment that you've raised is an important area, but also trying to unpack the cultural, tangible and intangible cultural heritage within these areas would make more sense in terms of direct policy intervention. Thank you very much, Ranasap. I've taken enough time, but if there's anything more, I'm very happy to talk about it tomorrow again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Satyji, for uh, 
linking all that so in a very simple way if i have to say in symbolic way chaturdika it means uh, four papers presented from four directions just covering the whole uh, mother india bharat mata and then all four together linked with one by satish ji so it becomes panchabhuta parmeshwara the five gross elements that make the total life so satish ji had done the work in a way to linking all the four directions coming from kanya kupari to going to uh, near by kailash to kedar and then from west to east like that so that was a very good we have the four paper by radhika borde from kutia harveen bandari so bp nair and december satiji so i personally express my very touchy and intimate thanks and gratitude for all these four speakers and then ultimately linking all the four thoughts into one by satiji thank you very much all of you and then uh, i think uh, this session to be closed but now i am hand over to the host dr praveen rana if he can add something and to say something yeah thank you professor rana uh, uh, as a student of tourism i was just wondering and watching the beautiful presentation by professor sati and uh, during my studies also i was also always wondering the story of uh, carrying capacity so whenever we used to study carrying capacity i always find it difficult question how to actually the manage the flow of whether it is the pilgrims pilgrims or tourists or whosoever so when i was citing a case study in my research work of uh, sikkim then i find a good good example where they are really able to manage this story of carrying capacity by defining that which area or which particular site how many vehicles how many pilgrims how many visitors are allowed the advantage of sikkim is since it is situated in such a way that they can control their entry points but when we whenever we thought about uttarakhand it is like open all the windows from all directions and we have seen the story of uh, kedarnath natural disaster uh, so that's what my observation is whenever we talk about carrying capacity or tourism development i have a always question in my mind that whether it is good that we say that we should develop a particular site and make it popularize uh, and and make it uh, available to everyone to use reuse and exploit or let it be less popular under develop and be like original so always this duality exists in my mind that how uh, like presently the geography is equipped with all gis technologies and remote sensing and everything do we have any uh, thing to balance between this carrying capacity and so called tourism development issues sir this is my observation if any anybody like to comment and especially professor sati no the thing is that um, the by this gdp of uttarakhand 50% gdp is dependent on uh, tourism and because there is no other uh, many livelihood options so people are dependent on, on only on this during the six months the many of people have this livelihood source from the tourism income so that is that's why we we want because um uh, development is uh, one of the important aspect though there you are talking about conservation also but those people are 100% re rely on uh, relied on the income from tourism so we if we protect the area say that we make it wilderness okay no problem but what about the people's livelihood so development is one of the different thing we have to think about both environmental conservation and development that is so that's why we are talking about let should be a tourism development in a nice way in a in a sustainable way we are talking yeah thank, thank you. you sir thank you thank you so there was some questions at facebook but people are uh, uh, not able to ask because there was i heard uh, i have seen that there is some question to radhika but what is the question i am still unable to find so give me one minute just to check the person from 
literature department i don't think he is so there was a question i, I i'll uh, communicate with radhika later on if the question will arrive because he was very much uh, observing your, your uh, presentation and uh, he was very much interested to ask few observation but i think he is not able to join whatever reason so uh, i think here we are uh, with permission of ekla president professor rana uh, i again thank you to all the speakers and viewers who have given their uh, valuable view and for wonderful day one inaugural session with some speakers and second session with radhika vp nayar sati sir professor satish kumar sir and uh, i'm uh, professor bhandari of course uh, so we are hopeful that uh, tomorrow also we'll have a great session and uh, i request all of you who are present today uh, to kindly join tomorrow also we are going to have a very nice session tomorrow also so i take a, oh, just a second uh, i think that uh, professor dalai from english department has joined to ask question to dr radhika uh, can you be here uh, another uh, minute let me see if he's dr dalai are you able to hear Dr. Dalai, are you able to hear? Yes, we can see Dr. Dalai video. Uh, Dr. Dalai is in, in uh, teaching literature in Department of English uh, at Faculty of Arts, Banaras Hindu University, and he is, uh, of course, a close friend of us. And uh, Dr. Dalai, can you ask a question to Dr. Radhika? Just a moment, uh, Dr. Radhika. Just a moment. his status is showing connecting to audio dr dalai we can see you dr dalai are you able to hear us आपकी आवाज अनम्यूट करिए ना यू कैन आस्क क्वेश्चन ओके ओके इट इज डन यस ओके Can I ask the question now? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I'm extremely sorry to uh, you know uh, interrupt you in the process because you are almost on the verge of winding up the session. Uh, first of all, uh, a big congratulation to the organizer, both uh, the senior Professor Rana Ji and the junior Professor Rana Ji, uh, Jyoti Ji, and all those participants. Uh, i am not a teacher of tourism i teach english here uh, in uh, banaras hindi university uh, though uh, nowadays i keep on cultural aspects not merely literature but the cultural sides of literatures and things all around us i have a question to uh, professor radhika borde uh, the question is it's rather a uh, observation an observation than a question uh basically what i noticed in your presentation when i was going through keenly about the slides that you were sh uh, showing it's basically uh, an obvious transformation that has crept into the tribal obvious example is uh, you see the tribal indigenous women putting on sarees which are not basically tribal in coat i in coat in this sense if you look at that uh, sarni women they have white sari with red border that is quite typical of their dress but in that place you have uh, quite a few uh, number of uh, women they are putting on sarees which are basically you know common to uh, the you know jharkhand people the, the the general people even the bengalis and odias and when i say bengali is let me give you another example of how the mainstream culture has also crept into their culture the putting on of kanch bengal 
you know the slide that you shared before the uh, people the, the tribes in odisha protesting against the capture of their sacred site uh, where you find a woman putting on conch in fact i was expecting that there would be a slide definitely where i'll see that the outside culture bengal odisha and jharkhand culture they have all together bombarded in a way imposed on them this is one uh, uh, change that i noticed uh, uh, from the pictures that you shared but most significantly there is another transformation in the tribal culture as far as the ritual and what you get the visual culture is concerned photography is concerned you see you share shared the picture of sarini mata if i'm if i'm correct yes but if you look at the iconography there sarini mata is not you know putting on sari till her toes or maybe ankle it is knee deep and if you look at the dress pattern of the mata also the hands are not properly covered usually as it happens with indian women or you know in some cases the tribal women also they would you know cover this this is not there so the dress is like this and if you look at the color the color is not what is usually believed though i do not believe in racialism i abhor rather but the color is basically white and if you look at the literature written there that's more of mainstream literature than the tribal literature this is my third observation how things need to be uh, properly observed when we interpret iconography the other one is you know when they were worshiping the tree uh, that sarhol festival or uh, sarni festival there were bamboos on the leaned against the, uh, the 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 tree there having branches so my question here in fact is why there were bamboos are bamboos related with your out tribes somewhere historically or mythologically so these are some of my observations and also a couple of questions for you i could not uh, you know restrain myself so i told uh, rana ji please get in me uh, get me there so that i can ask these questions bas that's it thank you ma thank you uh, is it okay if i answer your questions uh, please please okay sure so that was for very uh, interesting observations that uh, you made and definitely uh, as far as dress is concerned uh, there has been a huge change amongst uh, tribal women friend uh, you don't see too many examples of that anymore but there are some villages uh, in more remote parts of jharkhand and also in odisha where you do still see what would be considered the traditional dress as for your question about the bamboo poles it's an interesting question because it has a, a symbolic significance so uh, the deity who is believed to reside in the sacred groves is known as sarna mata and the bamboo pole represents a kind of male counterpart and that is a sky god called dharmesh and um, the pole basically symbolizes dharmesh and they lean the pole against the tree and the goddess is supposed to reside um, in the grove so uh, yes the bamboo poles are very important and uh, very significant uh, and it it does have this um, other uh, symbolism um, interestingly the worship is mostly to sarna mata but um, at the same time there is an acknowledgement of the male counterpart dharmesh and that's how the bamboo pole comes in I hope that was clear, or would you like me to give you some more details? Uh, uh, that was clear, but uh, you know, recently I have been uh, collaborating uh, with one of my colleagues here, and we are working on the Orao tribes in Koimur region. Right. Uh huh. So there, they uh, I learned that uh, these Oraos had their origin in Koimur district. Okay. That's in Bihar now, uh -huh. and they had a and they had a kingdom. Bamboo, exactly, Rota can all yeah. So yeah. they have this, they had this bamboo kingdom. In fact, mm -hmm. bamboo was their main stay, and that's mm -hmm. how it is related to their tribe. Bamboo being a cultural symbol 
you know, mm -hmm. symbol of their race, historicity and all. That's how I learned. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor Dalai and Dr. Radhika. A wonderful uh, discussion and uh, clarifications. So with uh, due permission, Professor Rana, uh, should we end the session for today? Yeah, so, now I think. Yeah, so thank you again for it. wonderful observations and uh, uh, your presentation. Thank you all. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you and see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vipi. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Bye.